Hey everyone, it's Sarah Threads to Nurse RN.com, and in this video, we're going to talk about the metabolic lab panel, which includes the BMP and the CMP. And as always, whenever you get done watching this YouTube video, you can access the free quiz that will test you on this content. So let's get started. For exams, and whenever you're working on the job as a nurse, what you want to know about the metabolic panel is what it assesses what those normal reference ranges are, and why your patient may be having abnormal values in specific areas, which we're gonna cover all three things in this video. Now, this video is actually part of a review series called Lab Values for Nurses. So if you're studying labs in school, or you're a new nurse needing to know what these tests look at, like the CBC, the PTI, and RD dimer, et cetera, you definitely wanna check out those videos in this series. So a metabolic panel is a very common blood test ordered on a patient. It is just as common as the complete blood count, which is a CBC that is also ordered on a patient many times. Now the CBC looked at specific cells that hang out in the blood, like white blood cells, red blood cells, platelets, et cetera. Now, a metabolic panel is going to look at electrolytes, the renal function of the person, and liver function. Now, a metabolic panel can be ordered in two ways by the physician. The physician can order a basic metabolic panel, which is a BMP, or they can order a comprehensive metabolic panel known as a CMP. Now, a CMP, hence, is called comprehensive, so it's gonna look a little bit more into some things in the blood. So it's gonna look at the electrolytes, the renal function. However, it's gonna take it a step further and look at liver function. So regardless of if they order a BMP or CMP, this sample is collected through a vein in the arm, usually, and you take a needle, withdraw that blood, put it in a tube, send it to the lab, and the lab will run that blood, and you will get the results back. So let's look at the difference between what a BMP covers and a CMP. A BMP, which again stands for basic metabolic panel, is going to just look at electrolytes and the person's renal function. So the electrolytes it's gonna look at are glucose, calcium, sodium, chloride, potassium, and carbon dioxide. And for renal function, it's going to look at the BUN and creatinine. However, the CMP, which again stands for comprehensive metabolic panel, is going to look at those electrolytes and renal function. Plus, it's going to look at the liver function, which includes ALP, which is alkaline phosphatase, AST, which is aspartate transaminase, LAT, which is alanine transaminase, and then it's gonna look at the bilirubin, total protein, albumin, and globulin. So first let's talk about the normal reference ranges and the causes for why we have abnormal lab results in the electrolyte part of the metabolic panel. Now these reference ranges are going to vary depending on the source you're looking at and the lab that you are using. So for exams, just know that they are going to give you something that is noticeably abnormal for a lab result. For instance, like with sodium, they're not gonna give you a lab result that is like right on the edge of that normal reference range. They're like, if they're gonna test you on hyponatremia, they're gonna give you something that is like 110, 115, that you're gonna know that that's abnormal. Or hypernatremia, something that's like 180, 200. So whenever you look at that lab result, you're gonna know, oh, this is not normal. So keep that in mind. Okay, the first electrolyte we're gonna talk about is glucose. Glucose is like sugar. So we're looking at the amount of sugar in a patient's blood. A normal reference range is about 70 to 100 milligrams per deciliter. And this is a reference range we use if the patient was fasting whenever we drew their blood. Now, if the patient hasn't been fasting, they've had food up to that point, this can be extended up to about 125 milligrams per deciliter. So let's talk about abnormal results, low versus high. So whenever a patient has a low glucose level, like less than 70, we call that hypoglycemia. What are some causes of hypoglycemia? Well, you see this a lot in patients who are diabetic, who are receiving insulin or oral diabetic medications. So let's say they've had too much insulin or they have had too much oral diabetic medication. This can drop their blood sugar, so we'd look at that. 
On the flip side, if it's higher than this reference range, we call that hyperglycemia. So what can cause a patient's glucose to rise in their blood? Well, several things. A lot of times it's with patients who have diabetes. It's not being managed very well. They need more insulin or more medication, or they're on certain medications that actually increase the glucose in the blood, like corticosteroids. Next is calcium. A normal calcium blood level is about 8.5 to 10.5 milligrams per deciliter. So anything less than 8.5 is termed hypocalcemia. So what could cause a low blood level of calcium? Well, there's a certain gland in your body that helps regulate calcium and it's known as the parathyroid gland. So sometimes a patient will have to have surgery to remove that gland, it's overactive, which is termed a parathyroidectomy. However, whenever that's removed, the nurse post-op really wants to monitor those calcium levels because they can drop. The patient can experience hypocalcemia. Another thing that can drop the calcium levels is if a patient doesn't have a really good intake of vitamin D because vitamin D helps us really absorb calcium. Then on the flip side, if we have a really high level, it's termed hypercalcemia. This is where a patient has a really high calcium level in their blood. What can cause this? Well, if a patient's parathyroid gland is really overactive, so we're just keeping more calcium in our blood, too much. Or if a patient has a really high intake of vitamin D, we're gonna increase how much calcium we're taking in. Now, whenever a patient has a high calcium level, you definitely wanna monitor them and their renal status because they're at risk for kidney stones. Then we have sodium and a normal sodium level is about 135 to 145 milli equivalents per liter. Anything less than this would be termed hyponatremia. So what could cause a low sodium level in the blood? Well, let's think about this. Your sodium is really regulated within your kidneys. So if a person has kidney problems, they are at risk for hyponatremia because certain areas of the tubules, they will either cause the body to keep, which reabsorb that sodium, put it back in the blood, or excrete it, which means that they're, they're gonna put it back into the urine. So as you're gonna see, a lot of these electrolytes are gonna be thrown off if a patient has renal failure. So renal insufficiency, also diuretics. We know from our reviews over diuretics that they act on certain areas of the tubules in the kidneys. So one diuretic family that can cause a low sodium level are thiazides. So they will actually cause the kidneys to waste that sodium, so you will lose it more in the urine and that will drop it in the blood. In addition, diarrhea can cause a low sodium level. However, on the flip side, what can increase this level really high? Well, Cushing syndrome can cause the body to, specifically those kidneys, to keep more sodium. Whenever that happens, you're gonna lose potassium. So whenever we jump over here to potassium, you'll see that in Cushing syndrome, potassium levels can drop. In addition, dehydration can increase the sodium levels in the blood along with renal insufficiency. The next we have chloride. A normal chloride level is about 95 to 105 milli equivalents per liter. So whenever the chloride level in the blood drops, we term that hypochloremia. But what can make the chloride level drop? Well, severe lung disease, like patients who have emphysema can experience this. Also patients who are using loop diuretics, because from our video where we talked about loop diuretics, we learned that they affect that loop of Henle and it can alter how chloride is reabsorbed. So if we are not really reabsorbing that in that part of the nephron, we're gonna lower those blood levels of chloride. Also, if the patient is losing a lot of chloride through either throwing it up or having diarrhea, that can happen. Then on the flip side, we can increase our chloride levels in our blood. This can happen again through probably how you've already guessed it, renal problems. So if within that tubule, it's really having problems reabsorb or reabsorbing too much chloride, we can increase our chloride levels in our blood. Next is potassium. A normal potassium level is about 3.5 to 5 milli equivalents per liter. Now all these electrolytes are important and we want to monitor them, but potassium is one of those ones that you want to really keep a close eye on. Because from experience, I have seen patients levels be really low 
or really high and you have this narrow range that you have to work within and a lot of times patients are on medications that can further drop their potassium levels or they're on medications that are really dependent on those potassium levels because if they're too abnormal it can increase the toxicity of that drug so keep an eye on this potassium level especially during your medication passes you want to know what that potassium level is before you throw on a lot of Lasix or furosemide. So a low potassium level, anything less than 3.5, is considered hypokalemia. So what can lower that? Well, one thing is like loop diuretics. They cause the body to waste potassium. Also corticosteroids can do that. Disease processes like Cushing syndrome can do this. So with Cushing syndrome, you have the high production of aldosterone. Aldosterone influences the kidneys and it's gonna tell specific parts of the kidneys to excrete potassium. So you're gonna lose it in your urine, which hence is gonna drop it in the blood. So you can have low levels with that. Plus if your patient's having a lot of fluid loss, it's rich in potassium, like diarrhea, vomiting, things like that. Then on the flip side, what can increase potassium? Well, if you're gonna be sending a patient for dialysis and their BUN and creatinine is crazy, I can guarantee their potassium level is gonna be really high. So renal failure will increase potassium levels. Also, Addison's disease. It's the opposite of Cushing syndrome in a sense. So with Addison's disease, you have low production of the aldosterone. So it's gonna cause the kidneys to actually keep more potassium instead of excrete it. So you can increase levels with that. And of course, medications can increase that potassium level. And two big ones are like those potassium sparing diuretics and ACE inhibitors. And then the last electrolyte that this metabolic panel looks at is carbon dioxide. A normal carbon dioxide level in the blood is about 21 to 31 milliequivalents per liter. So carbon dioxide plays a huge role with the acid-base balance in our body. And it is a waste product from metabolism. So much of the carbon dioxide that is in your blood is really in the form of bicarbonate. So if we have a low carbon dioxide level, our blood is really acidic. So what are some things that can cause your blood to be acidic? Diabetic ketoacidosis. Or if a patient ingests like toxic drugs, like if they have aspirin toxicity, this can do it. Now what can increase the carbon dioxide levels in the blood? Well, let's think about this. Patients who have respiratory issues where they like to retain carbon dioxide. So patients who have COPD can have this. And also sometimes assessed in this electrolyte part of this metabolic panel will be what's called an anion gap. Now, what is this? Well, this is calculated by looking at certain electrolytes within this metabolic panel, such as sodium, chloride, sometimes potassium, and bicarbonate, which comes from the CO2. So what this is gonna look at is the gap or the difference between the positively and negatively charged electrolytes in that panel. And what we're concerned about is a really high gap. So a normal gap is about three to 10 milliequivalents per liter. So we have a really big difference, hence a big gap, that's telling us that we probably have metabolic acidosis going on. Now, what causes that? Well, some conditions are like DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis, and renal failure. Now let's look at the renal function part that the metabolic panel assesses. So the metabolic panel is going to look at two important things, the BUN and the creatinine. And these two lab values really go together in helping us interpret how well those kidneys are working. And we're really concerned about lab values that are really high with the BUN and creatinine. So first, BUN. This measures the amount of urea nitrogen in the blood. And a range for this is anywhere between 5 to 20. So if this is really high, this is telling us, hmm, our kidneys are stressed out. What's our creatinine? A normal creatinine level should be anywhere between 0.6 to 1.2 milligrams per deciliter. So I want you to notice something about this range. It's very small. There should not be a lot of creatinine in your blood because your kidneys should filter majority of it out of the blood and you're gonna excrete it out in your urine. So let's talk a little bit about creatinine. Creatinine is a waste product from muscle. So your kidneys are made up of nephrons. And we talked about this in depth in a review over the anatomy of the kidneys, but your nephrons can 
have this glomerulus in it. And it filters your blood. So it's gonna remove water, ion slash electrolytes and waste. And one of those waste products is creatinine. And if the kidneys are not working well, like that glomerulus structure is not working well, it's not gonna be able to remove that creatinine from your blood. So those levels of creatinine in your blood are gonna rise. And that tells us that the kidneys are stressed out and they're not performing very well. It could be that they're failing due to like infection or they're not being perfused well, like in shock or something like that. So we can take it a step further and we can look and see what the patient's estimated GFR is. So GFR again stands for glomerular filtration rate. A normal rate should be greater than 60. If it's less than 60, we have renal insufficiency and those glomerulus are not working very well. So this estimated GFR is calculated by looking at the patient's creatinine, looking at their age, their sex, and their race. Now let's wrap up this lecture and let's talk about the liver function that this metabolic panel assesses, specifically that comprehensive metabolic panel. So it's gonna look at liver function and it's gonna look at the ALP. ALP is an enzyme that is found in your bones and liver. So a normal ALP is about 40 to 120 international units per liter. And we're really concerned about high results. This could indicate that we may have some liver or bone disease going on. Then it also looks at the AST and the ALT. And these two enzymes really go together because they're gonna tell us how really well this liver is working. AST, this is an enzyme found in the heart and the liver, and a normal level is about 10 to 40. And ALT is an enzyme that is found in the liver and the kidneys. And a normal level is about seven to 56. So if we have high levels, that could indicate that, hey, we definitely probably have some liver issues going on and that needs to further be investigated. Then it also looks at bilirubin. And a normal bilirubin level should be 0.1 to 1 milligrams per deciliter. And notice this range. That is really low. So the bilirubin level should be like less than one in your patient. Should be low just like the creatinine level. Now let's talk a little bit about bilirubin because it's gonna help you for your other exams and just understanding GI. So bilirubin is a product that is created from the breakdown of red blood cells. And this process occurs in the liver. So whenever red blood cells are broken down, it releases like this orangish yellowish substance. And normally this bilirubin should leave the body through the bile and be excreted in your stool. And that's what helps give your stool that nice brown color. But if you have some type of liver disease going on where this process is not occurring very well, or let's say that bile duct has maybe a stone in it or something's wrong with it, that bile can't drain out with that bilirubin in it, it will cause the blood levels of bilirubin to increase. And whenever that happens, you can start seeing that in your patient with really looking at, without looking at this lab value. Your patient will start to have like an orangish yellowish hue to their skin. Their mucous membrane, especially the whites of the eyes could have this yellowish tint color to it. And their urine will start to look different because as these levels build up in the blood, the kidneys filter the blood, remember? So that bilirubin will start leaking into the urine. And so when that person urinates, their urine will have an orangish color to it. Also assess is the total protein level. And this is the complete amount of proteins in the blood, such as globulin and albumin. So a normal level is about 6.2 to 8.2 grams per deciliter. Now, if we have a really low level, this could mean that the patient's liver just isn't producing enough of these proteins, or the kidneys are leaking proteins where they normally shouldn't leak proteins. Protein should stay in the blood. The kidneys shouldn't really filter them out unless there's some type of renal insufficiency. So you're losing it from the urine, which can drop the blood levels. If the levels are really high, this could mean that the patient may have some type of cancer or other type of liver problem. So then this test can take it a little further and look specifically at the globulin and the albumin. So globulin is a protein produced in the liver that is influenced by the immune system. So a normal level is about two to four grams per deciliter. And we're really concerned about high levels because that could mean that we have an immune problems like cancer. 
And then albumin. This is a big one that you definitely want to know. Albumin, a normal level, should be about 3.4 to 5.4 grams per deciliter. And albumin plays a huge role in regulating the oncotic pressure within the blood vessels. And if you don't have enough albumin within your blood vessels, your vessels start to leak and you'll get swelling. So we are really concerned about when those albumin levels drop because they'll have to be replenished so we can correct that oncotic pressure and help relieve those vessels from leaking. Okay, so that wraps up this review over the metabolic panel. And don't forget to access the free quiz that will test you on this content.